Hi, friends, and welcome to Screen Vomit, the only movie podcast for normal people. I'm your number one normal, Kayla, and here with me is my co-host, Kali J. Boing, going, 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 going. Kali J is still trying out uh, something new every time. <laughs> Wait, what did I say last week? I liked whatever last week was. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> oh, damn it. We got no business up top. No biz. Uh, yeah, we are certainly nearing the end of the year by the time this comes out. But uh, yeah. our next episode will be what we have our year end finales on. Oh, okay, so okay. That's going to be what we count as our <laughs> <laughs> year end wrap up. For now, we are covering the 2010 film Beyond the Black Rainbow. <sighs> And this is, of course, the director, Panos Cosmatos, who directed Mandy. I love him. His other movie from before Mandy. Mm -hmm. Probably maybe should be noted that this episode will certainly be a companion piece to our episode on Mandy. So yeah, if you haven't watched Mandy or at least listened to the episode, it's like a couple episodes back. Check that bad boy out because this is going to bring in a lot of that. (laughs) Yeah. He's distinct. That's it. Yes. Not easily mistaken for something else. And you know what? This movie might be one... This doesn't happen very often, but this might be one you have to see. Because the conversation is not going to capture this movie. Yeah. (laughs) There are long gaps of the movie of just psychedelic visuals. Yeah. But it's free on a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So you can for sure find it. Okay, so let's get into the cast. Okay. There's not too much of a cast on this one. Marilyn Nori, who plays Rosemary, is in Horns. She's also in Jennifer's Body and the original Little Women. Always standing Horns. I like Horns. Do we have to do it for the pod for you to like it? (laughs) Oh, I don't want to do Horns. (laughs) Hey, we'll see. She's really the only one that I, like, know anything she's been in. Michael J. Rogers and Scott Highlands have been in a lot of things. They both have, like, Michael J. Rogers has, like, 96 IMDb credits. Scott Highlands has 141 credits. And they're both kind of, like, character actors. They're in, like, one episode of everything ever. Yeah. Maybe it's, like, more Canadian stuff because they're everybody's Canadian, so... I don't know. Either way, I don't really know anything they've been in. <laughs> Sorry about that. You Michael J. Rogers was in two episodes of Bates Motel, and that's like the only thing oh. I recognize from his IMDb. Bates Motel. If y'all didn't know, we're the Bates twins. Yep. And uh, then we have Ava Bourne also starring in the movie and hasn't been in anything else. So <laughs> Baller. One and done. Stars in the movie and uh, is good. And have to honorable mention the music in this movie. Uh, the soundtrack is kind of notorious. So have to mention the music is by Jeremy Schmidt, who is in the band Black Mountain. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. there you go. Kali, what's our critic scores? <clears throat> me, 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 me. Okay. <laughs> Run tomatoes. Fifty-eight percent. Beh. Not good. Beh. Meta cricket. Forty-nine. Beh. Worse. Worse. And where's our babies? Google where's those users? Google users? Eighty-two percent. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know the boys got us. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. All right. Hell yeah. So um, let's watch the trailer and yeah. then we'll get into it. Damn, yeah. D- drats, because I feel like I only understand about seventy-five <laughs> percent of what happened in this movie, and I was and really, that's good. I was really banking on the trail. This trailer, I'm like, come on, jog my memory, give me the secret. <laughs> Came up dry. No, I'll help. That's actually good. First of all, the amount of reviews I've seen about this movie that mention the phrase. Cup of tea. <laughs> cup of tea? Yeah, not my cup of tea. Yeah, either it, this is not my cup of tea or this is good, but it has to be your cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very specific flavor. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You already can just feel from the music of the trailer the vibes. The vibes are rampant in this one. Oh, yeah. When I was watching this film, I was thinking like there aren't many directors where you could go into a movie not knowing who directed it and be like oh this is so-and-so's work panos cosmatos is that man oh yeah absolutely (laughs) you could watch 
I mean, he only has two movies, I guess. But, um, you know, you could watch anything he did and be like, oh, this is definitely a Panos Cosmatos film. There is such a flavor to it. What do we know about Panos Cosmatos? Do we know anything about him as a person? He looks, I like his yes. look. Look cutie. I know a lot now. <laughs> I'm assuming my man loves LSD. He actually doesn't. And uh, really? the LSD part is a critique on baby boomers trying to find enlightenment in the wrong areas, I think. At least that's as far as... It's hard because there's not a ton of um, interviews available with sure. him. But just from what I've pieced together is what it seems like to me okay this movie is meant to be and you mentioned not really knowing what's going on it's meant to be as narratively ambiguous as possible yes um he wanted to draw people in visually and sonically and have a little bit of a narrative story but allow people to make their own Uh, emotional interpretations of what's happening, of how the characters are related to each other. Mm -hmm. He called it a cinematic Rorschach test. (laughs) Yeah. And said there's no definitive or correct way to look at this movie. And because it's meant to be as ambiguous as possible, no interpretation can be wrong. And therefore, we cannot be wrong about anything we say in this episode. (laughs) Hell yeah. Well, we already established our infallibility. (laughs) Never been wrong, folks. (laughs) Never been wrong one time. (laughs) Man, this movie is such a piece of art. And the way that he works, like the way he describes his process working on movies really is like he is an artist. And whatever he puts out is exactly like the art that's like in his brain and in his soul, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's just pure, purely that. And um, that's so cool. And so not a lot of people get to do that. Yeah. It's really special. It's really special. Yeah. I, I think, you know, on a very just first thing that comes to mind is fucking whatever Batman Ju- Justice League. Justice- the first thing that comes to mind is Justice League. Hold on. I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting there. I, I Trust me. I'm just planting seeds. When I think. <laughs> no, but. So, but of if, art that has come straight from the heart and pure art, I no. think just. Oh my league. god! You don't let a person talk. <laughs> Explain myself. Okay. okay the point being, on. that movie was like torn to sh- was like edited to shreds. Too many fucking inputs over here, over there, constant like Joss Whedon and like the Zack Snyder and like too much. Way too much. And, like, it's a fucking mess. I know. I have seen bits and pieces of it. I I don't need to see it. But, like, you can tell it's so disjointed. As opposed to this that just feels... I I was just skimming through this Wikipedia article and uh, talking about the pacing and uh, visuals all that. And the word comes up that he calls it, like, a a trance film. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, like, that's what it feels like. Trance cinema. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like when you told me uh, who did the music for it, I just hovered over it. It's Black Mountain is a psychedelic rock band. And it does feel watching this does feel like listening to just kind of a long jam, Mm -hmm. just kind of meandering, but still progressing. And there's like there's enough linearity for you to grasp onto and to like keep you Mm -hmm. interested. But then... Those that hooks you in for just such long. It's like hypnotic. It really is. That's yeah. exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. I was hypnotized several times watching yeah, this. Yeah, same. Yeah. Threw me for a fucking loop. And it was really fun. Yeah. It's so fun because, like, it's so different. And it's going to end up being, uh, you know, having some similarities to Relaxer and just that I don't think that you can really discuss this on the same level as like normal films. Like, <laughs> no, no, there is like it's a so its own thing. <laughs> yeah. It's just very much show, not tell. Yeah. Aside from like the video at the top of like Dr. Arborea talking about the Arborea Institute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's intentionally ambiguous so that you can draw your own conclusions, but like the message remains there. Totally. Even if a, a bit hidden, you know? Yeah. It just It's purely art and purely artistic vision through and through, I think. Absolutely. And I loved 
that about this. <laughs> so this movie, Panos Cosmatos considers this a companion piece to Mandy. Okay. He calls this the breath in and Mandy the breath out. Like this movie is all about control, controlled emotions under the surface. And Mandy is all about the loss of control and the outward, you know, expression of emotion. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, I love that. And there's so many things that are, and we'll get to them, but there are so many connections between the two movies as you go through it. But yeah. not enough to where it's like, oh, what did you just copy paste this? Like, it's so different, but the same. It's like, you can tell it's by the same artist. <laughs> yeah. When you see two paintings by the same artist, you know? It's like he uses, just for example, he uses the exact same shot on the front of the car facing mm -hmm. the driver. He yeah. uses the same shot in Mandy and in this, and it doesn't feel like, I don't know, it doesn't feel repetitive because he doesn't overuse it, doesn't. it. He uses it once in each movie, and it feels like a little signature. Yeah. Can, we should get we should go to, from the top though. okay i didn't know if we were gonna go from i didn't know if there was a top to go from there is sort of okay um, okay there's a bit of narrative well and i also have just notes on and from panos mm -hmm. this was panos cosmato's first movie he made this as sort of a therapeutic way to get over his parents death his mom died in 1997 his dad died in 2005 i think and he was getting into like drinking and getting in bad shape and so quit all that went to therapy and <laughs> realized he needed to put his um artistic vision somewhere and this these ideas had been brewing in his head and he had the money his dad was actually also a director george p yeah. cosmatos and Panos self-funded this movie from royalties from his dad's movie Tombstone. Oh, shit. Um, so he's like, I had the money. I have the vision. I'm just going to do the thing I want to do. His dad did Tombstone? Yes. He's done several movies. So some of them look really cool. Oh, hell yeah. I just added Tombstone to my list because I remember watching it as a kid and loving it. I've never seen it, but I just added another one of his movies that I read a lot of stuff about Panos talking about uh, to my yeah. list. So we'll watch that one day. That rocks. So this movie, first of all, we've kind of mentioned it has a very specific look. <laughs> it has the Panos TM <laughs> Purple. look to it. <laughs> just like extreme colors. Nobody uses color like he does. I don't. I don't think. I've never seen it used. Uh, Safety Brothers use it really. I, it's just so different. They do. But it, it, Yeah, they do have really good use of color, but it's just the way he constructs his sets or his field of visions are, it could be only color and no oh, set, really. Yeah. And, and still, you know where you are. It's crazy. It's I love it. I love his style. He says that the look and feel of this movie was inspired by when he was a kid, he used to go to like a video store and browse the horror movie covers. Oh, hell so yeah. he wasn't allowed to watch the horror movies, but yep. he would like read the synopses and kind of, you know, envision what he thought they would look like or be like. That's and... more than I used to do. I would just look at the covers and get scared. <laughs> and then that just the covers would fucking haunt me. I was a wimp. <laughs> I was, it classically has been mentioned, watching horror movies since I was born. So <laughs> did nothing to me. Um, but, <laughs> but this movie really was an homage to like that vibe and that memory and those visualizations he would get while reading those synopses. Like once his dad died, he realized that time period, early 80s, was... Mm -hmm nostalgic era that he really held on to so yeah he wanted to kind of make a movie that felt like it was put out in that time but now that rocks 80s wasn't so much the vibe i picked up i like got from it but it really does fit now that i think about he it. says this is like a direct quote was it's an amalgamation of memories fantasies and nightmares from the past and not a reconstruction of reality because he never watched those movies well sure. at the time he never watched those movies obviously since then he's seen some movies <laughs> no but um, so these things aren't a lot of it's not based on direct things but a lot of it is actually too there are so many 
actually particular references throughout this movie. I didn't yeah. even write. There's probably like 30. <laughs> there's probably like 30 movies that are specifically referenced at different parts <laughs> that I've never seen most of them. <laughs> they always so. fucking do that. You can never. It's a scam. I, it's a scam. Mm-hmm. You can never catch up with all the freaking. Oh, I, I referenced this movie. You got to see these movies. I know. Yeah. Too many damn movies. They, yeah, there's just too many movies, but we're not complaining because we love movies. I do. <laughs> they did shoot it on 35 millimeter to try and fit that time, too. So that's where we get the grainy kind of stuff going on. Hell yeah. I would say this movie is much slower paced, much more slower paced and more, way more avant-garde maybe than Mandy was just comparing yes. the two. It's, uh, yeah, a whole different vibe. Yeah. It's hypnotic, and that, yes. I think that's the best word for it, really. Yeah. I, I love listening to metal instrumentals when I need to focus on something, and it reminds me of mm-hmm. just, like, a stoner metal instrumental song. But also, like, doesn't make you feel too many different things. It's really just on one wavelength. Yeah. This is for sure, like, we mentioned on the Mandy episode, too, like, this is a movie where you have to set a vibe for it. You have to cut the lights, like, sit down, really, like, look at the screen. Oh, yeah. I had the vibe set. It was good. Yeah, I did, too. You can't half-ass it. Like, you have to be all the way fucking in on it. You have to whole ass. I put my phone, I had to put my phone on the other side of the couch. I was like, I'm not gonna check my phone. I did end up, this rarely ever happens. But at one point in this movie, I did have to cover my eyes for a good chunk. You did? Yeah. Okay, you have to tell me when, when we get there. Oh, I absolutely will. Because I'm so curious to when that would have been. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so we said it opens with a commercial for the Arborea Institute, which is, or was, an institute trying to find a way for people to achieve happiness and inner peace through some sort of technology. And Panos was using the this company to kind of point to boomers (laughs) and how they dove into like the occult and crazy shit in search of spiritual enlightenment which just then kind of muddied their actual journey towards spiritual enlightenment and people were sold on crazy shit at that time (laughs) you know and you know maybe still are but it kind of became big at that time and this company was founded in the 60s so also should mention the opening credits i just thought were cool uh inside the expanding pupil of an eye and getting closer to the screen as the pupil opens i just thought that was kind of (laughs) neat i really fucking enjoyed it Mm -hmm. cool trick This one scientist who maybe works at this place is kind of like the protege of the head doctor of Dr. Arborea. Dr. Jerkwad. Barry Nile. I hate him. (laughs) He has been keeping a young girl captive beneath the institute somewhere. And this girl seemingly has the same powers as Eleven from Stranger Things. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's Uh, good. Some telepathy some can move things with her mind kind of stuff can change the tv channels with her mind can make people's nose bleed and head crush in kind of stuff yeah <laughs> yeah I, I i didn't make the comparison but uh, yeah that's exactly what it is like literally the first instance you see of her using her powers is her walking with the nurse and the nurse gets the nosebleed out of one nostril exactly like 11 does i the, the um, first thing i saw do not <laughs> you just watched it I do not think about Stranger Things. So this doctor... Dr. Jerkwad. Dr. Jerkwad, he's an asshole. Yeah, he fucking sucks. He controls, I don't know, this glowing pyramid, and when he turns it up, it sedates this girl. Elena is her name. That's the... Yep, that's the best way you can describe it. Yeah, it's... I mean, it's complicated to explain. She can't use her powers when the... When the pyramid's turned up. Yeah, and (laughs) early on, I wrote... Cult of glowing triangle? Question mark. <laughs> um, Is this the technology they were working on to try and make people happy? It seems like their initial mission is over. It seems like that's not still happening, but like maybe they still had funding, so like <laughs> they got the joint still up. <laughs> their initial message is like I wrote down serenity through technology. That's something they said, like mm-hmm. the last thing in the video they say, and so like they are positing the key to life. How to mm-hmm. be happy forever and everything's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, 
We gotta get to the. We gotta. We gotta keep going. Okay. <laughs> we have to go back to 1966 for me to explain about serenity through technology. Okay. So this girl has never met her parents, it seems, and this doctor is like being mean to her saying that her mom was hot and it's a shame she never got to meet her basically (laughs) out of the gate i'm just like this guy sucks i fucking hate him and he says like you don't know who you are or what you are but i know who i am and that's why i'm powerful and she communicates with him when she does like her head shakes all crazy and then telepathically communicates with him, she tells him she wants to see her father and he refuses mm-hmm. to take her to her father too. And you don't really get, at least I didn't at any point, you don't really get much context for how long she's been there. Mm-mm, not at that time. Uh, no. You're thrown into the middle of this story. Yeah. Around this time, I realized that Barry and Niall were the same person. <laughs> I hated it. He kept being called Barry by his mm-hmm. freaking wife, Rosemary. Wife question mark. It's never really said that she's his wife. She yeah. could be his sister. She could be his cousin. We don't really know. Live in, live in lady. Mm-hmm. Live in lady yeah. friend. Uh, when my mom talks about her boyfriend, she uses air quotes. She goes, my guy friend, Frank. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what this is, his <laughs> quote, <laughs> live-in lady, whatever her name is, Rosemary. <laughs> so we do see Elena watching TV. She changes the channels with her mind. And mm-hmm. I was kind of reminded of High Life. Remember when he was watching TV and it's just like old shit on TV? Yeah. I don't know. It just kind of reminded me of that Same scene. vibe. I also thought it was kind of wild, like how... This movie is so interesting because I don't know if we I even said out loud that it's set in 1983. Yeah, yeah. But it seems like so futuristic at the same time. I don't know. It's so interesting. Like yeah. the, the place they're in and all the technology and stuff like it just seems so futuristic, like space kind of stuff even. Yeah, I straight up forgot it was like set in 1983 yeah it does get so futuristic it does look very much like like a shinier looking 2001 a space odyssey at at points Mm. i um roast my ass i've never seen 2001 a space odyssey i tell you what don't watch it (laughs) boring piece of shit I know it's like one of the most famous movies of all time. It sucks, uh, dong. But I've not seen I it. I hate it. Oh, yeah. I really do. All right, I roast fucking... Collie's ass. <laughs> Bring it. It's a boring <laughs> fucking movie. I don't give a shit about it. Hell yeah. Um, you know, whenever I think, like, whenever I conceptualize 2001 A mm-hmm. Space Odyssey, um, what comes to my mind is Spaceballs. Uh, so... That is a great movie. <laughs> Spaceballs is like a four and a, four and a half star movie. Oh yeah, I love Spaceballs. I haven't even. I barely remember anything about that even, but oh, I so have funny. seen that at some point in the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Dr. Barry, what'd you call him? Dr. Jerk? Dr. Jerkwad. <laughs> Dr. Jerkwad. We hate him. Leaves a pic of this girl's mom in her room to kind of taunt her. Ugh. And then the nurse, Margot. Oh my god, Margot. There we go, Margot, yeah. Margot the dumbo. Nope, that's no good. Keep going. Margot had stumbled onto his little doctor <laughs> notebook or whatever about this girl and And the man's got some fucked up stuff in this notebook. I mean, he's having some pervert ideas about this Sure, sure, sure. And so she gets horrified. She puts the book back. But he finds out that she saw his pervert stuff. So he kind of sicks the girl on her in a backwards way. Yeah. So he had given the girl the pick of her mom. But he goes to the nurse and is like, hey, I think she's hiding an object in her room. The object being that pic of her mom but he doesn't tell her he's also massaging her shoulders when he tells her this i thought that was kind (sighs) of weird but um so she goes in the room to get the pic away from her and she's mean about it she's rude and then the girl explodes her head (laughs) yeah that was very cool psychic powers (laughs) look i was like margo hey you did it to yourself but thank you for your sacrifice cool death (laughs) you had a cool death there are only a couple deaths in this movie, but I think they're all cool. Besides one, maybe. Yeah. I mean, they're all badass from what I remember. Yeah. But uh, it's also not like, I mean, there are deaths, there are murders, but it's also not 
It's not a disturbing, like, murder movie. No, know? it's not like Mandy in that sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how they fit that stuff in there, but also keep the vibe of being hypnotic trance movie and not turn it into murder movie. Yeah. Interesting. I agree. So, yeah. So, he kind of just sent Margot in there to die, basically, and he knew yeah. what was going to happen. So, yeah. he's fucked up. Margot was very mean about it, though. She was. Her um, direction as a character was to be a crabby bank teller. Uh, yeah, vibe <laughs> achieved. I was just like, oh, God, I really would not want to interact with that person. Yeah. So some smoke goes in the room, knocks out Elena. Not sure why they had to use smoke, because they have the triangle thing. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. She gets knocked out. Then we get a needle to the neck. He loves a needle to the neck. I know. That was reminding me of Mandy when they had the stinger to the neck. Yeah, I wrote, he love, he neck poke. And, you know, both of those girls, the girl in this movie, Elena, and Mandy herself, are captured by sort of cult people. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't make that jump until now. <laughs> no, I didn't either. You did it. They're both captured by cult people, and they both get a needle to the neck. In this movie, the needle is delivering a tracking device from a sentient spacesuit I loved person. it. I love the yeah. name. Yeah, it's cool. The guys are cool. They're like red spacesuit guys. Unclear exactly what they are, <laughs> but yeah. uh, they're fucking cool is what they are. <laughs> yeah, they're badass. They are what freaking like Power Rangers should have looked like. Yeah, they're cool and scary. And they don't talk. No. So after this... This is when we meet Dr. Aboria. He's old as hell, uh, can barely yeah. move, looks like. Ugh. Dr. Jerkwad goes yes. into Dr. Aboria's office. And when Dr. Aboria, like, looks down and is like, could you uh, help me out? Like, a little uh, eyebrows moving kind of stuff. Uh. Uh, I was for sure he was asking for an HJ. Yes, me too. <laughs> I thought it was really? just going to be something <laughs> gross. I thought it was going to be like, can you wash me? Or like... I for sure thought it was an HJ. <laughs> give me a child to eat. I was I was like, it's going to be something disgusting. He's basically looking right at his weenie and saying, can you help me out with little eyebrows going on? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, where is this going? Uh, anyway, I'm glad I'm not a pervert. I would have preferred it gone a perverted route. <laughs> So what he did mean when he was asking, would you, uh, eyebrows, eyebrows, help me out, was will you shoot me up with drugs? Yep. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Jerkwad does shoot him up uh, with no. drugs. That's what I couldn't watch. Oh, that's what you couldn't watch? Yeah. I don't like needles in the first place. Uh-huh. And then in uh, the crotches of your toes? hands and toes, not a fan. It's too vulnerable of an area. I hate it. I got a stick through in between my toes one time Ah! <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> God damn, I bet that hurt. I uh, was in Mississippi and I was standing around in some sandals mm -hmm. and I looked down and there was like ants all over my feet. And so I kicked off my shoes and just took off running mm -hmm. and uh, stomped on a stick and it hurt real bad. And I was like, oh, man, I stepped on a stick. And so I uh, walked all the way back to the house, which was like a mile and a half mm -hmm, down the mm -hmm. road. And I just thought that I had like stepped on something and it hurt. But when I got there and I went to like show my aunt and I lifted up my foot, the whole bottom of my foot was covered in blood. Uh, and shit. I didn't know. <laughs> and I have a scar between my toes now. <laughs> wow. Uh, at least you got a scar out of it. Yeah. I got a couple through my life. <laughs> Just a couple. <laughs> I have several, yeah, <laughs> really. me too. Scars are cool. The stories of scars are cool. Yeah, I, I agree. Think. So at this point in the movie is when we get the flashback to 1966. Mm -hmm. The way this flashback looks, even, after how saturated with color the rest of the movie is, mm -hmm. and how, yeah, just deeply everything is colored... When we flash back to 1966, it is completely devoid of color. Yeah. It's black and white, but it's so washed out that all you see is like the tops of hair 
and eyes. Like you don't even see people's mouths really or anything else. No, it, it's hard to see much of anything most of the time. It's so striking. It's so cool. It really is. And when you do, fe- it feels like finding treasure when you finally make something out. In the trailer, you see someone crawling out of a black pool onto a white side. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of looking like the iris of an eye or something. And that's so fucking cool. And it's just the shit like that. The small little details where he fucking thrives. Yeah, so this scene looks crazy. Yeah. This is kind of the initiation ceremony of Dr. Jerkwad. Yeah, into like... Into their cults. Into their whatever they're selling (laughs) in the 60s when they're forming this company. The uh, Arborea Institute. Mm Mm-hmm. He has a third eye, like, painted on his face. Yep, very cool. And they give him this acid super drug, which is similar to the drug used in Mandy. Yeah. (gasps) Are these people the... Guar? Yeah. You know, could be. Damn. (laughs) Actually, I don't think it could be because they all die in this movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) At any rate. But... (laughs) <laughs> maybe guar are people who um dropped out of the institute <laughs> yeah 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 they're former affiliates yeah so yeah they give him this drug dr arborea himself tells him he's about to embark on a great journey and to bring the mother load back mm-hmm. and so he takes this drug and goes down in this like vat of black liquid and i don't know i thought maybe the stuff that he took could have been like ayahuasca sort of thing or something yeah too. Uh, especially based on what happens when he comes up. But while he's down, he has a scary trip. He has a bad trip. Oh, yeah. This is when we see the face melting guys. And he basically has a bad trip (sighs) and comes up insane. (laughs) Yeah. When he comes up, he's injured and he's lost his damn mind, basically. He has no hair. He has fucked up eyes. He comes up and starts puking. That's why I thought about ayahuasca. Like, they always say oh, okay. puke a lot. And with the hallucinations and stuff. And he bites the neck of the woman who was there and kills her. Yeah. Very weird death. It's hardly even shown because everything's so washed out. It's hard to know even exactly what's happening. Yeah. But he kills this woman. <laughs> yeah. For that sure. happens. I can tell you he that much. He comes up insane with no hair and fucked up eyes and kills a woman. Mm-hmm. Then some amount of time passes because his head is bandaged and a baby's now there. And Dr. Arborea submerges the baby into the black liquid also. Yep. The woman who died, we kind of surmise, was her mother. And Dr. Arborea is probably her dad. Okay. Okay. I'm tracking with you. You tracking with me? Yep. Yep, needed a second. Because then the doctor says... Your mother's reabsorption into the cycle of life won't be for nothing, my darling Elena. You will be the dawning of a new era for the human race. And the human soul. Let the new age of enlightenment begin. Oh. They killed their mom. <laughs> okay. Huh. Do you have other thoughts on this scene? Is this story about Timothy Leary? Conspiracy theory that I I don't want to get it wrong, but I, it has something to do with uh, CIA supplying Timothy Leary with LSD to give out to hippies and uh, no do, do good, no, what are they called? No good nicks? No good nicks? <laughs> um, and, as in an attempt to like pacify them. Yeah, and you know, there were other experiments uh, that were related to MKUltra that were not necessarily LSD related, but also were psychological experiments or other drug experiments meant to break them to the point where you could control them. Yeah. And yeah, I didn't make the connection with that to this, but you're right. Like there is possibly a tie there. I didn't read anything that necessarily connected okay. them, but... um. But I, I, that doesn't mean that they're not connected. I think that's an interesting take. I thought the goop that he dipped himself in and they dipped the baby in, I thought that was just more acid. You think so? That's how I read it. Because when he went in, that's when he really started fucking tripping, right? Mm-hmm. When he went under. So I was like, what if this is LSD-infused water or something or goop? But 
I had no fucking idea. I thought of it as like a baptism sort of Mm -hmm. type thing. It's unclear what the goo actually is. Like it's never said it's up for interpretation. It's one of those things about this movie that's up for interpretation. I thought of it as like some sort of baptism, maybe like a sensory deprivation kind of spot to where you're just left alone with your mind and your hallucinations. But yeah, who knows? There's an episode of Star Trek where they come on to, I think it's the season finale of season one of Star Trek Next Generation, where they go on to a planet that has a mysterious black goo that's sentient and takes people in. Maybe they're related. Kind of like the blob? Sort of. Maybe. You ever seen the blob? No. It's, uh, I've only seen like the 80s version of it. It's fun. It's gory and weird. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So when they zoom back to the present, the doc is dying. He's been shot with a fatal dose of heroin in his little toes. So basically, Dr. Dr. Dipshit, whatever we call Dr. him. Dr. Jerkwad. <laughs> Dr. Jerkwad. Um, Dr. Jerkwad murdered him with a fatal dose of heroin. Yeah. So he's uh, killing people left and right. All their interactions, any screen time that was devoted to Dr. Jerkwad, Dr. Jerkwad was just glaring at mm-hmm. uh, Arborea with just like, I fucking hate you eyes. Like body language just made it incredibly clear that he just wanted Arborea out of the way. What we know about Dr. Jerkwad Mm -hmm. is that he really is like obsessed with the girl. Yes. And wants to have access to this girl with no holds barred, wants to have complete control over her and probably also to study her because they don't know exactly what's the deal with her like psychic powers or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much Dr. Arborea knows about what exactly he's doing to the girl down there. Yeah. Or if... Well, I bet Dr. Arborea knows that she's there. I'd agree. Because he he knew when she was born. Mm -hmm. This girl is, according to the timeline, she'd be like 17 years old Mm -hmm. now. So she's presumably been down there her whole life. But what we also know about him is that this acid trip, black goo dip situation kind of ruined his life. I mean, it made him crazy. Yeah. And it injured him in a way that he has no body hair anymore he his eyes are all fucked up and reptilian he has to wear that terrible wig terrible wig yeah can't even get a good wig in this town no. and contacts and stuff and he's just kind <laughs> of isolated out there in- yeah I was really starting to, I don't know, pity him. Yeah. And it seems like that these men are like self-contained in this building too. Like their little nature preserve is in the building. When he goes home, you see that nature preserve through the window. So it seems like he lives in the building. Yeah. The doctor is like watching some kind of nature thing on TV. Like these videos of the nature. Beautiful, very. They make me remember a simpler time. Yes, Dr. Boy. Kind of seems like he hasn't seen nature or the outdoors in a long time either. Yeah, they are just completely isolated from all other society. Yeah, and um, he doesn't seem to be very happy well in general but with the mysterious what did we say like quote live in lady <laughs> yeah 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 or at his, his house his live in lady he doesn't seem to be very comfortable with his i don't want to say deformed but like with his new self like post injury yeah uh, either because when he does finally take off his uh what does she call them his appliances <laughs> his wig and his contacts and everything Mm -hmm. like she says like oh you haven't let me see you like this in so long so yeah it doesn't seem like he's very comfortable with who he really is sure his character's interesting and so you know that's actually the next scene is when he takes off his wig and his contacts he also has like a hot leather daddy outfit that he puts on (laughs) that he's been hiding all right It's pretty good. And when he puts it on, he's like moaning. He's like coming a little bit. <laughs> okay, gross. Bleep that out. <laughs> he's like bleep a little bit. 
<laughs> he's been dying to bust out this leather daddy outfit. He's like, okay, here's my true colors, baby. I'm taking off the wig. I'm putting on the leather. Yeah. And he also has a special knife that he calls the devil's teardrop. Also reminded me of Mandy. Like, it yep. has kind of the same look as the axe and Mandy as well. Yep. Panos loves his... Like custom weapons, custom holy <laughs> weapon, yeah. That always have names too, because the didn't the axe have a name? Too? It did. I I can't remember. Oh, I'm thinking of like the tear of Gordon or whatever. I mean, was. there are na- yeah, there are named <laughs> weapons in that movie. Uh, he's like, I looked into the eye of God and it was beautiful, like a black rainbow, and it chose me. So we got the titular line there. Then he also starts squeezing her head. And says he's going to set her free and squeezes her head to death. Also like Mandy. Yep. Almost the same kind of conversation is happening in that scene in Mandy that's happening right here too, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of the exact same thing. Yeah. But it feels so different. And the characters emotionally are in a much different place than they are in Mandy. Totally. There's not the gore-happy revenge violence. It's way more calm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it can it can be shocking and calm. It's way more calm and reserved. And yeah. the girl, the woman is just like, uh, oh, like, l- let me go, let me go. <laughs> <laughs> and then dies. There. Whereas, like, in Mandy, the guy who's dying is, like, going through every emotion so Yeah, okay, I big, see what you mean. So huge, you know? First, he's begging and pleading, and then he's like, oh, I'm God, I'm God. Oh. So badass. So anyway, similar death in both movies, but just with such a different feeling to them. Totally. Um, I totally get what you mean. Yeah. So meanwhile, while he's been squeezing this chick's head, (laughs) the girl, Elena, is on her way to escaping the institution. She goes in the vents, and the vents look so cool. They have the rainbow tubes. Mm -hmm. Really, the sets through the whole movie are insane. Like, How do they even envision this place like i, it's so... I was wondering that like how was any of this made was it custom made because it seems so unique uh i read that a lot of it is modular so that they can move things around and make multiple things oh, okay out of, okay you know yeah but still like i don't know it's wild i, I agree i know like the the biodome part of it and the outdoors obviously are locations in vancouver But other than that, I think everything was built. The rainbow tube vent, uh, the way that looked was actually based off of a recurring nightmare that the cinematographer has. Oh, shit. (laughs) About a stairwell that like leads to nothing. He described the entire nightmare in an interview, but it's long. Uh, Basically a stairwell that leads to darkness. Yeah. (laughs) So that's pretty insane. Yeah. She also goes through another person's room. A scary man who tries to eat her. Yeah, zombie question mark. Like, who is this man? (laughs) It doesn't seem like an actual zombie, but (sighs) it's something. That's what it... Look, if you haven't seen the movie and you're this far, it just looks like a zombie. She encounters another sentient, and he takes off his mask for her. Yeah. And underneath the mask is a baby. (laughs) She does escape the hospital eventually. And so she's out running around the wilderness, basically. Mm -hmm. Barry slash Dr. Jerkwad is driving around looking for her. This is another scene that is replicated in Mandy where he's driving in the car and he looks over to the passenger side. Mm -hmm. And in this movie, it's himself in the passenger seat. And Mandy, obviously, Nick Cage is driving, but Mandy appears. It's still, like, in both of them, the vibe's totally different. That scene in Mandy is, like, the end of the movie. He's possibly, like, reuniting with his dead girlfriend. The world suddenly turns to being, like, a sci-fi world. And he's, like, laughing and insane and going crazy. And um, in this movie, this man is... This is the beginning of his journey. And uh, he's, you know, a little frantic, but... Mostly chill. Like, he has a mission. He's got a purpose. He's, you know, they're just in such different places. Yeah. But it does gel really well. I love that. I mean, at the beginning, you called it a breath in and a breath out. I, it just, it fits it perfectly. Mm hmm. It just yeah, feels like you're just taking this in and you're preparing. Mm hmm. So he's tracking 
Elena with on the tracker they stuck in her neck. Mm-hmm. And he encounters these two metalheads in the woods. Oh, <laughs> my baby boys. Yeah, well, one of them's mean, and the other one's sad because the one's bullying him. Yeah, I felt well, bad I, for I felt guy. bad for what, the yeah. guy that got bullied, yeah. So when one goes to pee, Dr. Jerkwad kind of pops out of the bushes and stabs him up through the chin. Then he goes to the other guy and is like so worried that these men have Elena and that one of them has maybe had sex with her, mm-hmm. which neither of them do or have. He ends up stabbing that man inside the mouth, which was also reminiscent of Mandy. A, one of the killings in Mandy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> stabs him inside the mouth with his crazy named knife. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such an over the top stab. Like mm-hmm. then that blade inside goes in mouth. your mouth. Blood shooting out everywhere. I don't love it. I like it, Mandy. <laughs> I did I, this time. I was like, I don't know. I did like it. I still liked it. And it wasn't quite as, like in Mandy, they did the double, maybe even a triple, because he pushes it in and then pushes it in again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mandy, and in this movie, it's a one and done. He puts it in, he takes it out. Yeah, yeah. And there's much less emotion to it. So he does end up finding Elena, and she powers his feet to the ground. In his struggle to try and get out of this grip she has on his feet, he mm-hmm. falls down, hits his head on a rock, and instantly dies. <laughs> yep. I was really kind of bummed. You were like, bummed that he died? No, I was bummed that he died in such an anticlimactic way. I don't know. I thought it... I kind of liked it. I don't know. <laughs> Bonk. I don't know. I thought I loved the death of Margot. The way I rewound it like three times to try and figure out what was blowing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like eyeballs and brain or something. And it's just... So fucking cool. Uh, Mm -hmm. Whereas this was just kind of like, come on, like this, I love revenge. And I felt denied a gory revenge, (laughs) which is fine, is what it is. Hard to say if she even was out for revenge. She just wanted to be free. I'd be pissed off at the person who was like fucking taunting me on the other side of a glass she uh, does smile when he dies. Of course she does. Like, fuck that dude. Dr. Jerkwad mm-hmm. sucks. Um, She does smile. She's finally free. But it is kind of like she walks after that until she finds a suburban neighborhood. And it maybe kind of suggests that she's going to just be trapped all over again by suburbia. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and at the very end of the credits, there is like the little post cred very quick scene did you watch it yeah why you always think i'm the nuts one for not watching po- for an- i never watch post creds i love watching creds i don't care i'm pissed whenever the creds come up and the and like all these apps let me tell you about apps they always put be them on like, the side oh what do you want to watch next or something it's yeah like, get me out of here i want to watch the credits okay stop asking me what i want to watch next i'm not done watching the first thing Anyway. I appreciate it. They're getting me out of there. Wham, bam, <laughs> thank you, ma'am. So the post-cred is a sentient action figure with a radio transmission of, like, do you read, do you read? Mm-hmm. Which the interpretation I read about this, because I don't know exactly what I feel about this, but is maybe that suggests this was all part of some kind of fever dream loosely oh. based on reality. And maybe the whole movie was the acid trip. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and just like the things around you are coming into your trip. Like if you have that Sentinot action figure, obviously we saw Sentinots a few times in the movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, when Dr. Jerkwad gets a call on the phone, we're hearing that sort of over the radio kind of garbled stuff (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was any of it real i don't don't know oh jesus it's an interesting note to end on this movie is like 92 percent vibes i would say yeah (laughs) yeah so little linearity like there is story obviously i just went through the story of it but like it's so loose and like so much of it's up for interpretation and it's really just about the feelings. Yeah. So Kali, um, real vomit heads will know, last episode finally admitted that vibes exist. Yes. 
just in time for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> what do we rate this out of five? It's so difficult because you cannot rate this on a scale of normal movies. This is its own thing, first of all. Has to be said. My rating scale is universal to everything. It's how much did I enjoy watching it? Yeah. And for that, while I enjoyed the crazy imagery and cra- crazy colors, it was a little slow. I don't always want to watch it. Mm-hmm. Four stars. Okay. What about you? Yeah, I um, I think I'm going to go same. Yeah? Yeah, because I, I have so much appreciation for this movie and for Panos' work and putting himself out there, having such a strong artistic vision and accomplishing his vision. Absolutely. So much respect for that. But I do agree that this was a little bit slow. I will rewatch this movie for sure. Mm-hmm. But I, you have to be in such a s- space for this. <laughs> it takes a lot. Yeah. So yeah, would we recommend this? Yeah, absolutely. I'd recommend it. I'd say yeah, too. Yeah. But just be aware going in that this is a very particular type of movie and I'm not sure it's for everyone. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. You may fucking hate this movie and that's okay. <laughs> you might. <laughs> it's just such a, uh, as I said, cup of tea <laughs> yeah. comes to mind. <laughs> but I think it's really cool. And even if you don't love it as a movie, I think you have to appreciate it as a piece of art. Uh, yeah. I agree. Now it's time for Scream Bombit. Kali, what you been watching? I watched The Gate, 1987 horror movie. Eh, you don't need to watch it. It was fun and campy, <laughs> but it's like, I was expecting something more gruesome, but it's more like kind of Goonies, like mm. kid kid friendly which is fine i enjoy kid friendly shit but uh beh. i watched persona uh mm-hmm. 1966 directed Ooh, by i've been wanting to watch that too that's on my list ingmar bergman uh-huh. i've heard a lot about that movie weird good very good very very good but just very like like heady mm-hmm. shit hell yeah uh and then last night Lindsay and i watched where we just steadily Chipping away at Cronenberg's filmography, I guess. Uh, We watched A History of Violence from 2005. So good. Yeah? And fucking incredible. What have you been watching? Let's see. What did I watch? For my 90s movie club, we watched Scream 2, which was good. Better than the first, I thought. What? You're the only person who feels that i don't think so (laughs) the first one is like objectively the best one i disagree (laughs) oh my god and mary friend of the pod mary also disagrees she thought scream 2 was better i'm talking to freaking (laughs) social outcasts you don't know anything (laughs) no you don't know anything (laughs) watching luke wilson play steve ulrich steve ulrich Well, first of all, the the poor son of a gun's name is Skeet. (laughs) I read the word Steve when I was saying it. Oh, my God. (laughs) Watching Luke Wilson play Skeet Ulrich was incredible. That's the end of that. All right. So I also watched... Two other things. I watched Mm -hmm. Hillbilly Elegy. Okay. Which I was very surprised by. Of course, I've seen the memes going around with Amy Adams and Glenn Close looking all crazy. Mm -hmm. So I went in with low expectations, but I was actually um, pretty surprised. I also had no idea what the story was actually about. It's based off a book about this dude like growing up poor and having an abusive drug addict mom. So for me, relatable content. Mm -hmm. Um, And I felt like it was a fairly accurate emotional representation of that experience. There were some areas where I feel like they lacked a little. Like, they didn't really show the deterioration of Amy Adams' character or, like, any withdrawal, which was, for me, one of the harder parts of dealing with that situation. But other than that, emotionally, it was there. Glenn Close was incredible. There were some parts that were a little hard to watch, like, just 
as far as like the mother was pretty abusive. And I think I have trouble now because we do so much analysis of movies and I listen to so many actors talk about their experiences working that now I can only think about the actor's experience <laughs> like <laughs> in the movie. So like watching her like beat up this little kid, basically, I'm like, oh, I wonder what that little kid is feeling like right now. Yeah, right? Something like, it's got to be crazy. Anyway, I thought the movie was good and it was way better than I expected. The end, the very end was like a little corny, but I didn't hate it for that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fine. And then lastly, show wise, I watched Kidding. Have you heard of this show? No. (laughs) I'm Jay Leno again. (laughs) Hey, have you uh, heard of this uh, show, Kidding? Uh, it's on Showtime. It's got Jim Carrey. Okay, he plays yeah, I like have a, heard of this. He plays like a Mr. Rogers type guy mm-hmm. who like has a kid's show, but his son dies and he's like, life is falling apart and everything's going crazy. It's, uh, I would say it's fairly good. I can't tell if I love it or not. Yeah. Um, but I've watched it really quickly. It's at least like easy to digest. And it's interesting. It is like if you if you are aware at all of who Jim Carrey has been on Twitter for the last couple of years, um, <laughs> I would say it's extremely that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so there is that. I do still like watching him act in stuff. There's, you know, there's nostalgia there, even though I'm not sure how I feel about him as a person <laughs> anymore. Yeah, he's a... Uh... <laughs> fine did you did you watch that doc from when he was in man on the moon i did not andy and man me and andy me and andy did not watch that doc it made me hate jim carrey i'll be honest yeah Lindsay Uh, too because he was a goddamn asshole (laughs) but (laughs) Mm -hmm. i don't know the show was pretty fine kidding on showtime that's what i've been watching nice All right, you can follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at Screen Vomit. One word on all the things. Give us a subscribe on your podcast app if you haven't already. And if you like us, leave us a rating and review, but also tell your friends. I don't know, post about it. Let other people know that we exist because I only got so many friends. Send us an email at screenvomitpod at gmail.com with your thoughts on this movie other movies suggest movies um check out collie's other podcast how to fire your boss next week we will be watching the kids are all right and that episode will also be our end of the year recap episode and we'll have our top recommendations from the year that we did and also the fan voted number one movie that we did this year so That's going to be really exciting. The movie is free on Peacock, on the Peacock app. Oh, boy, the Peacock uh, app. So watch it there. It's for free. Dang it. And we will see you then. Bye. Bye.